The Peter Schiff Show. There used to be a lot of talk about the so-called strong dollar policy. We had the strong dollar policy when Bill Clinton was president, George Bush, I guess when Barack Obama was president as well. And I've talked about it. I wrote about it in uh, Crash Proof, How to Profit from the Coming Economic Collapse. I mean, I kind of talked about it like it was the Loch Ness Monster in that everybody knows about it. Everybody's heard about it, but no one's actually seen it because we didn't actually have an official policy that constituted the strong dollar policy. It was simply talking about the strong dollar being in the national interest. And that was just the mantra that was repeated often by the Secretary of the Treasury or by the President. We like a strong dollar. A strong dollar is good for America. And that pretty much constituted the policy. But nonetheless, having the belief that there was some kind of hidden strong dollar policy helped to create confidence in the dollar. Even periods of time where the dollar was declining, perhaps it would have declined even more had it not been for the belief that there was some kind of strong dollar policy. And of course, when the dollar was rising, well, the strong dollar policy really helped add fuel to the increase because after all, you were riding the policy. So the dollar was going up and that was what the U.S. government wanted. So it was all good, right? The trend was your friend. Well, it should be obvious that Donald Trump has a weak dollar policy. Whether he wants to name it a weak dollar policy or not, that's the policy. Now, of course, the weak dollar policy will not involve actually doing anything, just like the strong dollar policy didn't involve doing anything. But I think the rhetoric will have the same impact in that when the dollar finally starts to fall, it will fall even faster when people think it's a deliberate policy. Right. And people won't hold out hope that, oh, the the administration is going to do something to stop the dollar's decline when if they believe that the dollar's decline is persistent with our policy to have a weak dollar, then why would we be worried about some kind of intervention to stop the dollar's decline when the dollar's decline is exactly what the administration wants? Now, you know, this should be obvious because the president has talked about this in the past. But in the news today, we got first earlier in the morning, there were some rumors that came out based on some things that the president said at a fundraiser over the Hamptons. And obviously, the summertime in the Hamptons, you've got some big wigs uh, at a fundraiser, wealthy donors. And the president was lamenting the fact that the Fed had been raising rates. I think it's, what, five rate hikes since he's been president. He's you know not even been president for two years, and the Fed's been raising rates. And I think you should count uh, the rate hike that happened you know, after the election, but before the inauguration. Uh, that's you know, kind of on his watch. So he's been critical of the Fed uh, for having raised rates. And you know, one of the things he said, apparently, was that when he nominated Powell, He had expected him to be a easier money guy, that he nominated him thinking that he wouldn't have all these rate hikes. And so he's disappointed that his nominee is not being as easy when it comes to monetary policy as what he had hoped when when he appointed him. And later on in the day, he reiterated these comments and expanded on them in a Reuters interview where he basically said, yeah, I'm going to keep on criticizing the Fed if they keep on raising rates. And he called out not only the Chinese, but the Europeans for manipulating their currency. Now, the dollar has been rising this year, right? It fell a lot last year during the first year of the Trump administration. And I didn't hear Trump calling, you know, manipulation when the euro was rising against the dollar, when the Chinese yuan was rising. But now those currencies have been falling. And ironically, one of the reasons they're falling is because of the trade war that he has initiated Because a lot of people believe that we're going to win this war. And of course, Trump is out there trumpeting the economy, talking about how great the economy is, tweeting about how great it is every day. That's also what's driving money into the dollar. It's not that the Europeans and the Chinese are manipulating their currencies lower. It's a lot of the things that Trump has been doing 
has been helping to artificially prop up the dollar and drive it higher. And the president should actually be glad because one of the reasons and probably the main reason the U.S. stock market has not suffered as much as global markets, you know, because of all the warmongering about the trade war is because of the strong dollar is the belief that the U.S. is going to win the trade war. That's what's keeping a bid in the dollar. That's what's supporting the U.S. stock market. And, of course, people being worried about foreign currencies, particularly emerging market currencies, is putting downward pressure on their stock markets and their currencies as well. But it's also feeding flows back into the U.S. market, creating the false optimism out there that, hey, we're the, we're the uh, best place to be. We're the safe haven. I've actually heard people try to argue that U.S. stocks are now a safe haven. Forget gold, right? Stocks are, are the U.S. safe haven, which is complete nonsense. But, of course, this is helping the president, you know, trying to talk about how great everything is because the, you know, the belief, the confidence in this economy and in the Fed and the rate hikes. The president is criticizing the rate hikes, but it's the rate hikes and the expectation that we're going to get more rate hikes that has been propping up the dollar, which has been, by extension, propping up the U.S. markets and making the U.S. markets appear to be a safer bet than the foreign markets, which are having to deal with weaker currencies. But all this is going to change. And one of the things that is very interesting is that Trump is criticizing the Fed. And I've said this, Trump is laying a foundation to blame the Federal Reserve for the next economic downturn for the next market downturn. It's clear that, you know, that's going to be the scapegoat. Now, I think that the Fed may, in fact, blame Trump because of the trade war, right? Because the, the, the Fed can come and say everything was great, right? Our policies were working. You screwed it all up with the trade war. Now, that's not true. Their policies never worked. They simply blew air into a bubble. But Trump, of course, already claimed that that bubble was a great economy and took credit for it. So everybody is going to have to try to blame the other party. But the truth of the matter is Donald Trump was correct as a candidate when he blamed the Fed. See, he's wrong to blame the Fed now because what he is accusing the Fed of doing is not the problem. The problem is what the Fed did before Trump was elected. The rate hikes are not the problem. The problem was that rates were lower. In the first place, you know, when Trump was a candidate, he criticized the Fed for the right reasons, right? Trump said that the Fed was acting political, doing political things. He specifically accused the Fed of trying to help Obama to make the economy look better, to help Hillary Clinton. He said it was a bubble, that the Fed policy was propping up uh, the stock market, but that eventually it was going to come collapsing down, that this was all a bubble, the Fed was being political, and they shouldn't do that. And Trump was right. The Fed was being political when Obama was president. The problem now is that Trump's criticism of the Fed is that the Fed is not being political enough now that he's president. What he's upset about is that the Fed, under Powell, is not extending the same courtesy that the Fed extended to Barack Obama when Yellen or Bernanke were Fed chairman. He put a guy in there that he expected to be political, and now he's not doing what he expected. But, I mean, this is hypocrisy. If you're going to criticize the Fed for being political when your opponent was the beneficiary, when Obama was the beneficiary, you can't be upset when the Fed isn't acting political to help you, I mean, you have to be consistent. Either you think a political Fed is good or not. See, he's saying, Trump is saying that the Fed should be helping him, right, to help the economy. Well, that's what the Fed was doing when Obama was there. They were helping Obama, right? But it doesn't really help the economy when you're just inflating a bubble. What helps the economy is to let the, uh, the, the market function freely to allow resources to be reallocated efficiently, to allow inflated asset prices to fall, to allow the short-term pain that is required to experience long-term gain. But the central banks never want to do that. They didn't want to do that under Obama. They didn't want to do it under Bush either. But now uh, Trump is upset that maybe they're not going to do that while he's president. Now, Trump is wrong. The Fed is ultimately going to be very political. They are not going to allow the free market to work. They are not going to allow 
the bubble to deflate with, you know, with, without interfering, because that would be horrific. That would expose immediately how bad their past policies were. So eventually, the Fed is going to bail out the economy or try to bail out the economy. But politically, it's going to be too late for Trump. Right? It's going to help Trump's Democratic successor because when the Federal Reserve has to come and bail out the economy after Trump claimed it was the greatest economy in the history of the country, it's going to look like the Fed is now bailing out the economy from the damage that Trump did. And Trump is already, again, establishing his arguing point to try to blame the Federal Reserve, but the Federal Reserve and the Democrats will be blaming Trump. And I think the voters are more likely uh, to believe the Fed and the Democrats than Donald Trump. Now, had Donald Trump been more honest about the true state of the economy the entire time and not taken false credit for making everything great, had he stayed to his original message that the Federal Reserve screwed up this economy under my predecessors and here's what's needed uh, to correct the damage, then maybe he would have had a more legitimate chance of, of, of a re-election. But I think if this whole thing implodes on his watch after he first raised hopes about how great everything was, and now he's begging for the Fed to come bail him out, bail the markets out, bail the economy out. The bailout is now going to be uh, as a result of the policies that he supposedly implemented. Right? He supposedly inherited this great economy from Obama and he screwed it all up. And now the Fed needs to bail everybody out. The reality is, had Hillary Clinton won and had we not had this bout of optimism based on promises that are not going to be kept, had we not been able to get another shot of fiscal stimulus with these tax cuts, we would have had the recession much sooner. And of course, the Fed would have returned to uh, 0% interest rates and quantitative easing. In fact, I believe had Hillary Clinton won the election, we would not have had all the rate hikes that have already taken place. In fact, the Fed would probably already have eased. The Fed would already have launched another round of quantitative easing because we would have already been in recession. And then clearly that recession would have been blamed on Hillary or Obama. But instead, now this even greater recession is going to be blamed on Trump. Now, we're going to get the FOMC minutes out on Wednesday, and we'll see if those minutes reflect any type of influence uh, from uh, the Trump administration. I doubt that they will. As far as I can tell, the Fed is going to continue uh, to act as if everything is great and as if they've got clear sailing to continue to raise interest rates and shrink their balance sheet as if none of this uh, was going to have any impact on the economy. Meanwhile, you know, the dollar did weaken somewhat when we got the initial rumors of uh, the, the fundraiser comments over the weekend, and then it fell again when we got the Reuters story. So the dollar did get back below 96, now at 95.90. Gold was up about five bucks. I mean, it gained a little bit um, as a result of this, but it didn't really have a big day. But, you know, we are back above 11.90. Uh, we're over $20 off the low, maybe 25 I forget how low we got uh, a few days ago, last week at night, uh, before we had that big 20-day uh, uh, intraday reversal in the price of gold. Like to see it back above 1200 though. Uh, that would be a good indicator that maybe we just washed out this most recent round of selling with record short interest, by the way, in uh, among the hedge funds. I mean, the last time they were actually net short, uh, was around 2001 or 2002, right at the bottom when gold was under 300. I mean, back in December of 20, uh, 2015, when gold was at 1,050, just before a 30-point rally, um, we didn't have hedge funds net short, but they had the lowest long that they had they'd pretty much ever had, but they still were not net short. Now they've actually gone net short. That's something that rarely happens. And again, the last time it happened, gold was under 300 and about to explode right on that huge 10-year uh, run. So I think that's a pretty good sign. But let me get back to, to uh, the Trump administration and some of the inconsistencies or hypocrisy, because one of the things that Trump did as a candidate, you know, in addition to correctly criticizing the Fed, 
for basically doing what he's now wishing that they would do, right? So instead of being consistent, he also pointed out that government interference in the markets uh, was part of the reason that we had the housing bubble and the financial crisis. He you know, talked about that. But now Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are doing the exact same thing that Trump and other people criticized uh, the government for doing in contributing to the housing bubble. Over the weekend, I read that Fannie and Freddie are now going to make it even easier for low-income people with poor credit to overpay for houses they can't afford. I mean, they are now going to allow 3% down mortgages. And the 3% doesn't even have to come from the guy who's buying the house. He can get it from, you know, a parent. He can get it from, you know, a relative. I mean, I don't know. He can get it. Who knows? Maybe he can even get it from the seller who's kicking it back. But they want to allow people who don't have the money for a down payment and who really don't have the money to even afford the home. Right. Because they're, they, they, they have lousy credit and their income is low. And right? they want to help these people to buy homes. Now, homes are still at record highs. Affordability is at a record low. See, that's why it's so hard for people to afford homes. They're too expensive. And of course, they can't save a down payment and they don't have enough income and they have bad credit. Why should these people be buying homes? I mean, if you're really concerned, let home prices go down. Affordability is at a record high. Let real estate prices fall. Now, the Trump administration doesn't want real estate prices to fall. They want to try to keep real estate prices high as long as possible, even though that's bad economics. So what do they want to do? They want to make sure that Fannie and Freddie are enabling more people to buy homes they can't afford and to pay the higher prices, to keep the prices from falling. Fannie and Freddie are now completely owned by the U.S. government. They're not even, you know, quasi-government agencies anymore. They're not really private with stockholders. All the marching orders come from the White House. They're all basically uh, arms of the government. So if Fannie and Freddie are doing something, obviously the Trump administration is allowing it, right? They should be stopping this. If we really want to drain the swamp, why don't we drain the swamps at Fannie and Freddie? Look at all the damage these institutions did before the 2008 financial crisis. Now we want to enable them to do even more. Like we learned nothing from our mistakes. First of all, 3% down is not enough money. The commission on a real estate transaction is 5 or 6%. So if you buy a house and you put 3% down, the minute you close escrow, you have no equity. Because if you want to sell the house, it will cost you more than 3% to sell it. So assuming the house is worth what you paid, you're underwater the minute you sign on the dotted line, right? So what kind of nonsense is that? There, there are two main purposes for a down payment. One is so there's collateral. So the bank has a pretty good idea that the buyer is not going to walk away because he's got skin in the game, right? And if the buyer does walk away or can't make his payments, well, then when you put the home on the market and sell it, there's something left. You know, you got a little bit of a cushion. You've got 20% down, right? 80% loan to value, uh, the other reason that you want a down payment is because at least it shows you that the guy who's buying the house could afford to save money. Right? If he gets the money from his parents, that doesn't mean he saved anything. I mean, being able to save money is an important uh, element if you're going to be a homeowner. Why? Because maintaining a home is very expensive. See, if you're a renter, you don't have to worry about a lot of these things that happen to your home because the landlord has to pay for that stuff. Right? You just have to be able to pay the rent. But when you own a house, you have to have a lot of savings so that you can cover costs that come up, unexpected problems that come up when you own a home. And so if you can't save enough money to have a down payment, then how are you going to save money while you're working to fix the things that go wrong with the home, to maintain the condition of the home, which is the collateral for the loan. Because if the homeowner can't even afford to maintain the property, it's depreciating. And then if he doesn't make the payments and the bank forecloses, you know, they, they may lose money. So there are a lot of reasons to want uh, a big down payment. But this, this is all politics. This is the government trying to help people 
buy homes they can't afford simply to prevent prices from falling to the point where more people can actually afford them. But again, they want to keep the bubble going as long as possible. Trump is probably worried, oh, housing prices are going to come down. The midterms are coming up. What can we do to keep prices up? Oh, let's get some more air into this bubble. Let's find a way to get more people who don't have any money and have low credit, no income. Let's help them get into some homes so that we can keep the price from falling. But of course, the more people that they bring into the market, the more unqualified, low-income people buy homes and overpay, right? The, the bigger the bust is going to happen. But again, it's business as usual in Washington. It's who cares? We want to get through the midterms. Then we got to get through the next general election. Let's kick the can down the road. Let's make the bubble as big as we can um, because we'll just hope it doesn't pop on our watch. But you know what? I think it's too big. I think the air is coming out on Trump's watch. doesn't matter how much they do to kick the can down the road. At this point, the can's too big and there's not enough road. You know, by the way, I read this other article, too, on uh, college costs. Just I was reading this article up on Zero Hedge, and it showed this huge acceleration in the costs of tuition, uh, uh, college housing, textbooks, just over the last, you know, 10 years or so, just as fast as it was going up before, it, the curve is actually accelerated. And the amount of student loans is just, you know, what is it now, 1.6 trillion? I mean, it is growing like a cancer. And the reason for this is because Barack Obama, and I pointed this out the minute he did it, what it was going to do. The, the Obama administration basically uh, cut out the banks from the student loan. See, the first mistake the government made was guaranteeing student loans in the first place because now banks made loans to students that they otherwise wouldn't loan money to because they probably weren't going to be able to pay it back. But once the government guaranteed the loans, then anybody could get a loan and it was free money for the lenders because it didn't matter, right? As long as you loan money to a student, if the student didn't pay, the government would. So it was guaranteed profits. It didn't matter. You don't have to have any underwriting standards, right? Just make these loans. So the banks made off like bandits. The colleges made off like bandits because they could charge whatever they want because the kids could get the government guaranteed loans. The only losers were the students who got lousy educations and graduated with a lot of debt. Now, Barack Obama comes in and he says, oh, this is horrible. We have all these student loans. And he thinks the problem is the profit motive of the banks. He's like, well, if we can just get the profit out of lending, right? If we can just get rid of the profit motive, then it'll be more efficient. Well, first of all, it's the profit motive that makes things efficient, right? That's why communism doesn't work, because there is no profit motive other than the, the profit of the, the bureaucrats. But that's not really profit, because profits are earned. The money that the bureaucrats get is extracted at gunpoint. So you earn a profit through voluntary uh, ex exchange. Government bureaucrats make money through theft, through force, and through a gun. So, you know, that's, that's bad. You, don't, you, you can't call that a profit, right? That's just bounty or loot or whatever you want to call it. So the minute uh, Barack Obama said we're going to make, you know, the college loans more efficient by taking out the profits, right, you know, you know the whole thing is going to fail. So at the time that he unveiled the government takeover where, okay, the government's not going to guarantee college loans anymore. The government's just going to make the loans directly. We're going to cut out the middleman. We're going to cut out the profits, and it's all going to be more efficient. I knew that the opposite would, in fact, happen, and that is exactly what happened. Once we cut out the middleman, the government made it even easier for students to borrow even more money, which made it even easier for colleges and universities to jack up tuition even faster than they could in the past. So everything associated with going to college, the prices are now increasing at an even faster rate than they were before the Obama administration took the profit out. Right? The, the opposite, again, every time the government seeks out to do something, the opposite is what is in fact achieved. And so the government has screwed up the housing market. The government has screwed up uh, the, the, the college uh, tuition market, and it continues to make the same mistakes under uh, Trump that it made under prior administrations. While he continues to boast about how we have the greatest economy ever and that he's made America great again, nothing has been made great. Now, I disagree with the quote from Cuomo, who said America was never great. I mean, America was very great. I mean, America is probably the greatest nation that the world has ever produced. But unfortunately, America lost her greatness, but we haven't recovered it. We haven't become great again 
contrary to the premature victory dance that the president, uh, you know, continues to, you know, put on, we're not great again. If we were great, we would get rid of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. If we were great, the government would be out of the student loan business. What is Trump waiting for? Why don't, why doesn't he just close down Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac? Why can't we have a free market in housing? I mean, the guy's in a real estate. He should understand the real estate market. He made his fortune in real estate. You know, unfortunately, because he's in real estate, that's why he likes inflation. That's why he's a low interest rate guy. That's why he's a cheap money guy. From the perspective of a real estate investor, inflation is great, right? I mean, because what does inflation do? It wipes out the, the debt, the value of your debt. People in real estate borrow a lot of money and then they buy real estate. Well, inflation makes the value of the debt go down. And so they achieve profits on these leveraged transactions. And then they constantly avoid taxes by selling property and buying other property and doing 1031 exchanges. But they keep accumulating all this wealth. And a lot of it is because they accumulate wealth based on debt. They borrow all this money and then inflation basically wipes out a lot of the liability. So from his own selfish vantage point as a real estate investor, inflation is great. And I can understand why in Trump's experience, you know, this, this, this is a good thing. Because the negatives of inflation, right, making the cost of food go up, making the cost of health care go up, making the cost of, you know, clothing and, and education, all these things. Trump doesn't care about that. I mean, when you're really rich, it doesn't matter if the cost of food goes up because you've got plenty of money, right? If you're levered up and you've got lots of assets and your creditors are getting screwed, inflation transfers wealth from lenders to debtors. Very wealthy people like Trump are big debtors. Right. It's the average American who's, you know, a creditor through his pension, right, or through, you know, through his cash value and his annuities and his uh, life insurance policies or, you know, his paychecks and everything is denominated in dollars. And if you don't have the financial assets, you know, inflation really stings. Inflation really hurts. But Trump doesn't feel any of that pain. And so he takes that perspective to the White House and he's like, yeah, we need cheap money. We need inflation. Maybe Donald Trump needs it as a real estate investor and as a debtor, but it's the last thing the U.S. economy needs. If we want uh, to have a great economy, if we want a rising tide to lift all boats, we want sound money. I mean, when America was great, we had sound money. The dollar wasn't just as good as gold. The dollar was gold. And, and we had limited government. We had tiny government. Donald Trump is expanding government. He's making government bigger. He's increasing welfare spending. He's increasing warfare spending. He wants to start the space force. But this is not what a great country does. A great country makes government as small as possible. And it's the small government that allows the private sector to get bigger and greater. I want to talk also a little bit about Bitcoin. I mean, not so much uh, about the price. I mean, Bitcoin is still trading in a range kind of just above the support level. I believe, as I said, we are just biding our time, uh, suckering enough people into the market uh, before we have the next big leg down in not only uh, Bitcoin, but in all of the, the cryptocurrencies. But one of the big drawbacks, of course, of cryptocurrencies has to do with the fact that they could get stolen. They could get lost. In case in point, I read this article about a guy, Michael Turpin, uh, who had about $24 million worth of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency stolen right off of his cell phone. I mean, using his cell phone, they stole it out of his wallet and he's suing AT&T for $240 million. So obviously he wants to get some punitive damages in addition to what he actually lost. Now, of course, again, we have a country where anybody can sue anybody for anything. And so, you know, I don't doubt that this lawsuit is out there. But believe me, you know, if you're a cryptocurrency fan, you don't want this lawsuit to succeed. I mean, I don't think it has a chance, although it's America, so I'm never going to say never. But legally, I don't think AT&T is liable for any of these damages. But assuming they could be found liable, I mean, why would AT&T or any cell phone company even want to allow any, uh, you know, digital currencies on their phones, I mean, on their platform. They wouldn't even allow the apps. I mean, because there's so much risk that they could be stolen. I mean, nobody wants to get sued because if they're stolen, they're gone, right? It's not like you can recover what was stolen. I mean, that's part of the anonymity of the whole thing. I mean, if it's gone, it's gone. And that's one of the reasons 
that criminals are so attracted uh, to cryptocurrencies because if they steal them, right, it, they're much more likely to get away with it than if they, you know, try to steal, you know, your dollars or your euros or, you know, these credit card fraud scams. It's much easier to recover. So there's no way that the cell phone companies would want to be potentially liable for the value of uh, stolen cryptocurrencies. And of course, you can have schemes where the person whose cryptocurrency is stolen, maybe he's in on it. Maybe he gets a friend anonymously to somehow steal his cryptocurrency and then he wants to blame the cell phone company. Now, I know in this case, the AT&T, yes, some of the things that they did, unfortunately, made it easier for the criminals to uh, um, you know, commit this crime because what happened is somebody came into an AT&T store and claimed that they lost the SIM card and they had this guy's phone number and they said, hey, I need a new SIM. I lost my SIM card. Here's maybe they had some ID or something and they got the SIM card and now they were able to use that because, you know, when you put the code in, I guess they send something back to you. They text it back and they were able to authenticate it with this, with, you know, with this phone number. And so they were able to quickly steal the money or steal the cryptocurrency before the actual owner of that number realized that now he didn't have the phone number anymore because a criminal, because I'm sure the whole crime took place in a matter of minutes, because once they got that SIM, the guy obviously knew exactly what he needed to do uh, to complete this, because he must have had a lot of other passwords and codes, but this was just the final piece of the puzzle that he needed uh, to pull off the crime. And I think uh, Michael Turpin had, you know, had told AT&T that, you know, they had tried and there had been people who had tried to hack into his account. And I think maybe we want heightened security or something like that. But the bottom line is, if Michael Turpin knew that people were trying to break into his phone, he should have found a more secure way to store his crypto wealth. I mean, it's not AT&T's fault, even if they are at fault for giving the SIM card to the wrong person, they cannot be held liable for the crimes that take place later on that they can have no reasonable expectation of being liable for. To think that, hey, I gave somebody uh, the wrong uh, SIM card and they stole $24 million right out of his phone. I mean, that is not a reasonable liability that any company could realistically think that they may have when they gave out uh, that SIM card. And if you can't have a reasonable expectation that something might happen, you really can't hold AT&T liable for the things that happen. And if anything, it's anybody who owns cryptocurrency knows that they could be hacked. They could be stolen, right? That's part of the problem with it. Now, some people think, well, that's part of the, the good thing with it, right? That it is anonymous. It is uh, decentralized, right? There's no authority. Okay, well, there's good parts about that and there's bad parts about that. And one of the bad parts about that is they could be stolen and you have very little recourse. And so Michael Turpin has nobody to blame but himself. Sure, he can blame the criminal, right? Yeah, that's fine. But he can't blame AT&T because they screwed up and because they screwed up, he got $24 million worth of cryptocurrency stolen. He's the one that screwed up by, by leaving that cryptocurrency in such a position that it could be stolen. And that is the risk, again, that every single owner of Bitcoin or any other currency has to accept when they're in this market. And you got to take the precautions to protect what you have. Now, of course, eventually the market's going to take all it all anyway when everything comes crashing down. But between now and then, you got to make sure that a criminal doesn't steal your cryptocurrencies before the market steals their value. I wanted to finish up this podcast by talking about uh, an article that I read earlier today about an actress, Asaya Agento. And I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing her, her, her name right. She's Italian. And, but she was one of the big uh, Me Tooers. She's one of the women that came out and said, yeah, Harvey Weinstein raped me when I was, I think, 21 years old. And she was one of the most vocal critics of, of Harvey Weinstein. And of course, you know, I'm not defending Harvey Weinstein. I mean, I talked a lot about Harvey Weinstein in, in prior podcasts, so I don't want to, you know, revisit all of that material. Uh, but, you know, I, I certainly uh, believe from, you know, all of the evidence that's out, out there that Harvey Weinstein likely raped several women. Right. And and in other cases, he didn't maybe rape them, but maybe he coerced them into sex through uh, intimidation, through almost like extortion or blackmail. And all that stuff is wrong. And, you know, I think that he should have been 
you know, held accountable for his actions a long time ago. But I also know that not everybody who is in the Me Too movement who is accusing Harvey Weinstein of rape is telling the truth, right? Men lie about stuff and, and, and so do women. And there are plenty of women out there who probably used Harvey Weinstein and his reputation to their advantage. Women will use sex to get what they want. I bet there's plenty of actresses that willingly slept with Harvey Weinstein because they thought it would get him apart in a movie or help their career, right? So this happens. You know, the women should be as mad at those women, right? If you're a woman who plays it straight and doesn't want to sleep her way to the top, right? And you just want to get ahead on your acting talent, right? And you want to get the part because you're the best for the part. You should be mad at the other actresses that are sleeping with the casting directors to get the part instead of you, right? Just like if you're an athlete and another athlete is taking, you know, steroids or some other kind of dope that is artificially enhancing their performance, that's cheating. So if you're a woman and you're, you know, you're sleeping with guys to get parts, you're cheating, right? So I'm sure there's plenty of these women that came out uh, that, you know, that may have had sex with Harvey Weinstein that were not raped at all, right? I'm not saying that some of them weren't, but I, I seriously doubt that all of them were. But this woman, here's the, the, the irony of it is, so it just came out today that about five years ago, she had sex with a 17-year-old uh, actor, a child actor. She Apparently, she worked with this kid when he was much younger than seven, 17. So uh, they kind of had a relationship. She played his mother uh, in, in something. I'm not really sure what it was, but they had some kind of reunion. Uh, the, so the show is no longer on the air because now, you know, he's grown up and they're on the different things. So he's 17 uh, and and she is 37. This guy's name is Jimmy Bennett. I, I, I hadn't heard of him. But anyway, so she meets up with Bennett. He's 17. She's 37. They're in a hotel room in Hollywood and they have sex. Right? I don't need to get into the details. I read some of them, but, you know, they had sex. Um, and now, like just recently, she had to pay this guy uh, a bunch of money, basically hush money, uh, to, to keep the story under wraps. And she paid him $380,000. $380,000. Now, first of all, I mean, the irony here is kind of obvious because the same person who has accused Weinstein of, you know, molesting her or raping her has now been accused herself by an underage boy, 17 years old, and said, hey, you raped me, right? Because the age of consent is 18. Well, he was only 17, so he couldn't consent. Therefore, she raped him. Now, normally, you know, I'm not going to side with the victim. And I'm not actually siding with this victim because I don't think there is a victim here, right? I don't think a 17-year-old kid who has a sexual experience with a hot 37-year-old actress, I don't think that kid has been abused. Now, could there be certain circumstances? Again, I don't know all the facts of this. And is it possible that this 17-year-old kid did not have a good time and was not high-fiving all his buddies the next day, you know, when he was telling them all the details, right? But, I mean, I know what 17-year-old guys are like. I mean, I used to be a 17-year-old guy, and this is something that, you know, we dream about when you're 17, to have something like this happen to you. I mean, forget about getting paid $380,000 on top of getting to have sex with a hot 37-year-old actress. I mean, talk about winning the lottery. I mean, this is probably about the best thing that can happen to a 17-year-old. Imagine how long the line would be of 17-year-olds lining up for this experience. Right. So to act like, oh, this is horrible. She had sex with this 17 year old kid. I mean, he's 17, not 13, 17, probably high school senior. Maybe he's already graduated, heading to college. I mean, first of all, chances are he probably wasn't a virgin. But even if he was, maybe it's even better. Right. If, you know, you get some older, experienced woman to show you show you the ropes, you know, just build up your self-confidence, your ego. So you go off to college and, you know, you've been with a woman and you know how to please a woman and it makes you feel better. I mean, this is not, you know, uh, the, even though it's like, it's not even like she's his teacher and she's the student. I mean, they're not, they, you know, they're not involved with each other. I mean, they know each other, but there's no power here. There's no coercion. I mean, I read that she probably gave him some alcohol, but I mean, I doubt she needed to get the guy drunk. I mean, what woman needs to get a 17-year-old drunk to have sex with him. I mean, I read, I put this article up on my, my Facebook page 
And you know, I look at the comments and, you know, one person talks about, hey, hey, why do we say he got lucky? You know, why don't we ever say that it's the woman who got lucky when she has sex? Look, women don't have to have luck to have sex. They just need to have a pulse, right? Guys have a hard time getting sex, not women, right? So if a, if a guy gets, you know, you know, 17 year olds particularly uh, gets into this situation, he he's getting lucky, you know, now. People are saying, well, Peter, you have a double standard because if it was a 37-year-old man and a 17-year-old woman, you would be saying something different. And yeah, I would be saying something different, but also it depends on the circumstances. Look, I mean, sometimes, you know, a guy can meet a 17-year-old woman in a bar. She's got a fake ID and she's all dressed up and she looks like she's 27 and they have sex, right? That's one thing. Obviously, this woman knew that this kid was 17 years old. Right. So if you're talking about a situation where a 37 year old man knows a girl is 17 and has sex with her. Yeah, I got a problem with that because men and women are different. Right. I've got a uh, a 16 year old son. He's going to be 16 in a week. And, you know, if when he was 17, if you know, if this happened to him, you know, I, you know, I would I would not have a problem with it. You know, I'd probably be giving him a high five just like like his buddies. But if my daughter, who's only two. Right. If this happened to her, I'd want to punch the guy in the nose because men and women are different. You know, they just are. And to not accept that is is, is to deny nature, to, 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 to deny what what men are and what women are. Women do need to be protected when women are young. They need to be protected from older men. I mean, I am an older man. They need protection. I know. And especially when I was 37. Right. I mean, so society needs to protect younger women from guys that would prey on them, older men that would prey on them. 17-year-old boys do not need to be protected from older women. They can handle themselves, right? They're not going to be overpowered by a woman. They're not going to be forced by a woman to do something that they don't want to do. That's not going to be the case with women. So society can look differently at the two situations. But yes, you know, they you have to look at the circumstances behind each. But I'm wondering now, I mean, how many Me Too's are there going to be now? Because that was the big thing. Oh, everybody wants to come out and say, oh, you know, Harvey Weinstein. Well, how many more guys are going to come out now and claim uh, that they were raped, uh, that they were molested because older women took advantage of them? Or maybe even if he wasn't 17. See, apparently she gave him alcohol and then had sex with him, right? So maybe not only was he under the age of 17, but he couldn't consent because he was drunk. Well, how many drunk men now want to sue women, right? And obviously the woman's going to have to have some money in order for you to sue them. That's the problem, right? So you have to find a wealthier woman that you can claim got you drunk and therefore you couldn't consent to have sex because you were drunk. Look, guys are going to have sex no matter what, right? I mean, I guess unless it's with another guy. I mean, they're, you know, yeah, I mean, if a man is getting a guy drunk and having sex with him, the guy's not gay. Yeah, there's, you know, the alcohol probably played a big role in that. But you don't have to get a guy drunk in order to get him to have sex. You just have to ask him and you can have sex with him pretty much. You know, when I was on the Joe Rogan show, I brought up the idea of a male gigolo because I talk about discrimination. And I asked Joe Rogan, I said, hey, Joe, if um, if you were a male prostitute, you were a gigolo, right? And this was, we were talking about discrimination having to do with the, you know, the, the decorating or baking of a, a gay, gay wedding cake where the government says you can't discriminate. And I asked Joe, I said, well, what if you were a gigolo, male prostitute, and a guy wanted to hire you? Would you, would you have to take his money? I mean, could you discriminate against men, right? He's no, I don't want to have sex with men. I'm, I'm having sex with women, right? Well, one of the main reasons that, um, most prostitutes are women, not men, is because men are the ones that by and large have to go out and pay for sex. I mean, women don't do it. I mean, some women do it. I'm not saying they never do it. Yes, there are male prostitutes. They're there. They're a tiny percentage of the, you know, the overall population of prostitutes. They exist, but it's the exception. It's not the rule. But the reason that all this happens is because men's, uh, men's roles, men's attitudes are extremely different when it comes to sex and when it comes to uh, how they view sex and how they feel about it 
and the emotions that go along with it. And so because of these very different sex roles, the fact that a 37-year-old woman has sex with a 17-year-old guy is very different than if you flip the genders around. And it is not sexist. It is not a double standard to recognize this. But my main point of bringing this up is to see what happens, because all this is going to be a bunch of nonsense, because to the extent that now you're opening up the window to guys who got lucky to come out and now shake down the women. Now, some people might think it's poetic justice, right? Because, hey, you know, the women are doing it to the guys. So let's let the guys turn around and do it to the women. But all of this is, you know, the legal system run amok where you can sue anybody for anything and everybody is afraid of being publicly shamed. They're publicly outed. Uh, and, and, and so you open up this Pandora's box of litigation where everybody is afraid to do anything. You know, one last thing, I guess kind of on the subject, but off the subject. I, I, re I read this article uh, on the Internet today that one of these porn websites is called Tube 8. And apparently they want to start paying people to watch porn. I'm thinking, finally, this is a job that, you know, most liberal arts graduates, right, are actually qualified to do, right, watch porn and get paid. But before you rush to send in your resumes or apply for these jobs, the catch is you're going to get paid in cryptocurrency. And I'm not really sure what this cryptocurrency is worth. It's some new token, vice token, right, that the porn industry has created. So even the porn industry is now into the crypto game. So you're not even going to get Bitcoin. You're going to get vice token, whatever that's called. Uh, but you're going to get paid to watch porn. And obviously, almost all the applicants are going to be guys, right? They're not, they're not going to be women. You know, and by the way, too, I, I'm sure I pointed this out, but, you know, all of the, you know, talk about equal pay for equal work when you have a lot of people in Hollywood and they want to claim, oh, you know, the, the women aren't paid as much as the men, right? The, the women make, you know, X, 90 cents, 80 cents on the dollar that the male stars are paid more uh, than the female stars, not in adult entertainment, not in porn. In porn, the women out-earn the men by a large factor. I mean, no one even cares about the men. I mean, everybody watches porn to see the women, right? I mean, because it's guys that are watching porn, just like it's guys that are, that are uh, you know, that are hiring the prostitutes. So in porn, it's, 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 it's where the money is. So if guys are paying to see women, then the women are getting all the money. I mean, a lot of the guys probably do the porn stuff for free, right? I mean, you know, and probably for the women, and I don't really, you know, know people that are in the porn industry, but I'm sure if you're a woman and you're in porn, it is kind of embarrassing to have to admit that you're in porn. And I think, you know, so you got to get paid more money uh, for, you know, being in that industry. And I think women or, you know, other women or men in general will look at female porn stars uh, and, you know, in a certain way that they're not going to look at, Male porn stars. I mean, probably men who are porn stars probably brag about the fact that they're in porn. They're like, oh, look, look at me, right? I mean, it's probably like you know, you know, uh, kind of like an honor of young men that you're that you're even big enough to qualify to be in a porn movie. Plus, you get to have all that sex, right? I mean, men probably think that's fun. Although I don't know. I mean, with all the lights and all the stuff, I mean, maybe it, maybe it's not quite as fun as I think it is. Uh, but you know, that's also part of the reason. See, if it was all based on discrimination, if producers and directors and everybody, if they just discriminated against women, if it was so easy to pay women less than men, then why are they paying women porn stars more than they pay men, right? If you have a woman and a man in the same scene, right, they're both, they're both having sex for the same amount of time in the same scene, if they could pay the women less than the men, they would do it. I mean, why not? Because the men are probably barely being paid and the women get a lot. I mean, why aren't these uh, sexist men? And I'm sure a lot of the producers are men, right? A lot of the directors are men, right, of these porns, you know. So why aren't they just paying women less, right? Why can't they just do that? Why can't they just exploit all the women and pay them less than the men? Because the free market won't let them. It's the market that determines your rate of pay. If it's the women that sell the tickets, or I don't even know, there's no tickets anymore. Nobody goes to the theater. I'm not even sure how porn makes money when everything is free. But however they make money, it's because of the women. And because the women have the power, then the women are able to negotiate higher pay than the men. And so to the extent that men are getting paid more in non-porn, it's for the same reason. 
right? It's not because of gender discrimination. It's because of the box office. What drives your compensation is your own productivity. It's how much money do you make the producer of the film. And if you can make them more, then you're going to get paid more. It has nothing to do with uh, sexism. It has nothing to do with discrimination. It's all about the bottom line. And that's the only thing that's fair, right? What's unfair is trying to force people uh, to pay one sex more than another because you say that they should all earn the same. They don't, right? Because the free market doesn't care what sex you are, right? The free market just cares about the value, the productivity that you bring to the job that you're hired to do.